and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, future, if we can find out about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and the forthcoming McCartney Legacy Volume 1. Can't remember what the subtitle is because we haven't finished writing it yet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And uh, I'm a writer about music for various publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and anyone who will send some cash for me to do it. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. How's it going? It is going well. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV 90.7 FM in the New York area since, what, 1983? Very long time. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. How's it going? It's going pretty good. You push it, it goes. Thanks Uh so much, Alan. And hi, Ken. (laughs) Hi, Darren. Okay, and we have a special guest today, uh, Dave Morell, who is the author of now four books. Uh, volume four just came out. It's called Run Out Groove, Inside Capitals, 1980 Hits and Stiffs. covers the years basically 1980 to 1990. And we will talk to him after the news, which Ken will give us now. Okay. Thank you, Alan. And just so everyone knows, uh, Dave was a promo man for many years at various record companies and at Capitol uh, during that decade of the 80s. So we'll be talking to him in just a few seconds. Um, First of all, of course, the biggest news item of the last couple of weeks was Ringo Starr turning 80 years old on July the 7th. And there was a big birthday special airing on his YouTube channel which I really think was uh, extremely well produced. It was a combination of pre-taped performances of Ringo songs or Beatles songs and uh, also uh, birthday messages from his friends and also his family, including his grandkids and great-grandkids. And uh, I think it was pulled off extremely well. It was uh, also a mixture of uh, announcing four different charities that you could donate that are very important to Ringo and should be to us. And um, I really enjoyed it. I think one of the big highlights for me would have to be uh, certainly uh, watching the performance of Helter Skelter of Paul McCartney with his band and Ringo on drums from Dodger Stadium from July of 2019. That was fantastic. Um, There's an altered video, I should say, of Give More Love, which was made a few years ago, but they superimposed a whole bunch of other artists singing lines from it, adding that to the video. And that was nice. Uh, A retrospective video for the song, photograph, uh, all kinds of things. Birthday messages sent to Ringo from his friends and family, including his grandkids and great-grandkids. And uh, so I'd like to know from the two of you what you thought about it. Start with Darren. I thought it was very charming. I enjoyed the show uh, very much. It was a little rough around the edges. It wasn't like a, you know, a produced for uh, super mass consumption. You know, this was something that was going to be, I would imagine it also kind of came together rather suddenly, the idea to do, do something like this with the virus, uh, you know, affecting every aspect of our lives. But I think it came off very charming. Some of the performances were outstanding. I really enjoyed Cheryl Crow. And I think I heard, I think I saw you post something. It could have been you, Ken, on Facebook. I did not know that that was Cheryl Crow's dad. Mm. Uh, that that was part of uh, the performance. He was playing what? Trumpet? Horn? Uh, I th- uh, yeah, I think was trumpet. trumpet. Well, uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl did uh, All You Need Is Love beautifully. You know, split screen. She was playing... Uh, all the different instruments, who knew about her playing cello, you know, uh, it was really cool. And Sheil E was pretty cool. Uh, I could have done without Joe Walsh's performance. Uh, uh, boys. Too, yeah, wasn't too crazy about that. Uh, ben Harper and Dave Grohl, 
uh, was cool, and the fact that they performed down and out. Yes. Was like, Whoa. I mean, I, I was listening to the song and it took me like a quarter of the way through for it to occur to me. Holy smoke. They pulled out a B side to perform. Mm. That's a lot of fun. That'll make yeah. all the hardcore Ringo fans happy. One of the funny things that probably not many people caught was that you could tell that Dave Grohl's involvement was last minute, last minute addition to play drums with uh, Ben Harper. Uh, so initially it was just going to be Ben Harper. Uh, was going to be performing. So they had the, Ringo recorded his introduction to Ben Harper, uh, but when he recorded it, Dave Grohl wasn't in the picture. So uh, they had Ringo record plus Dave Grohl. And it just the way it, it sounded, you could tell they, they, they edited Ringo saying, and Dave Grohl in there, and it sounded pretty comical. But it, it, it came off very charming. The whole show worked uh, really well. And I love the way they fit in all the charities scattered throughout the hour. It was about an hour and uh, a little, you know, gave you a little information on each charity. And it was done very well, almost like a little mini Labor Day telethon type of concept. So it was really nice. And I haven't seen it a second time, but I do believe it is floating out there on YouTube still because I yes, think it I've is. Seen people posting links to it. So if you didn't catch it as it happened. You can still watch it, right? Yeah, it's still it's still on YouTube as we speak. Yeah, Alan, how about you? Yeah, I enjoyed it too, and basically a lot of what I have to say is what the two of you already said. You know, the Paul and Ringo clip was great, Helter Skelter, um, and and a lot of the individual performances. Apparently, they got more performances than they could fit into that from the various people um, who also sent birthday messages, etc. Um, and on on YouTube, there are a number of the clips that were apparently sent in, but that there wasn't time for. There was one from Peter Frampton. I can't remember what he sang. It was a Don't Come Easy. Uh, it was a Don't Come Easy. I was going to, that would have been my guess. Yeah. And, you know, and a few others, like, uh, you know, maybe um, 20 to 30 minutes worth of, of things. Um, and at least when I looked on YouTube to, um, you know, get the Ringo show itself, because, you know, I saw it when it was on TV, but, you know, I have to have things in my collection. So I went to YouTube to be able to download it, and then suddenly it, like, never stopped. It kept going on with all of these other clips. So if you didn't catch those, try to, you know, find a, a link to the full show, and you probably will get the others as well. Yeah. I know so they Colin Hay. Colin Hay did photograph. Right. Yeah. So they tacked that on to the original hour program. I think they're actually separate videos, but they're on a playlist so uh, that it, it, when the show ends, the next thing just I comes right on. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, some birthday messages were sent online prior to the birthday special. Paul McCartney's message read, Happy birthday, Sir Richard, alias Ringo. Have a great day, my longtime buddy, Paul. Uh, something that got a lot of attention, Pete Best actually sent a birthday message. And it said, thought about it and thought, why not? Happy birthday, Ringo. It's a special one. Have a good day. Yoko Ono, her message was, happy, happy birthday, Ringo. Lots of peace and love, Yoko. And there were plenty of others, but we have so much other news to get to here. Over this past weekend, uh, New York's public television station, WNET, ran the documentary of an accidental studio, which tells the story of George Harrison's handmade films company. It ran through all of the success stories and a few of the failures of the film company. Success stories like Life of Brian, Time Bandits, The Long Good Friday, Mona Lisa. Uh, it also went into how the film company started, uh, George's attitude towards the film industry and his company, and also his relationship with his business partner, Dennis O'Brien. It is coming out on DVD, also Blu-ray and HD digital, and that's all on July the 28th. I really enjoyed it. So uh, in addition to this release, though I'm not sure, it may be airing on your local PBS station. You would have to check your local listings, go online, go to the website 
of your local PBS station in your area because, um, you know, it did air for me in the New York area over this past weekend. And uh, I did enjoy it because basically I think what they tried to bring out was that George Harrison was interested in putting out films that he considered quality films. He wanted comedy films and also films that deal with hope. And basically any member of Monty Python, if they were involved, George signed on with it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't really seem to have aspirations of making this the biggest film company in the world. His big, his business partner, Dennis O'Brien really wanted the company to expand. And he took on a lot of films that didn't do all that well. And after about 10 years, uh, the company produced 23 films, which really is quite a lot. But I think George had been kind of tired of it and fed up with it and tired of risking a lot of money every time a new film film was started. So um, it really brings that across throughout the film. And I think they do an excellent job. What they broadcast on PBS was an edited version of uh, the full documentary, which, like I said, is coming out on DVD, Blu-ray and HD digital, which you can order online right now, coming out July the 28th. An accidental studio. Ringo Starr appears in a new documentary on the career of Mae West, which is called Dirty Blonde. And it's actually been on demand through PBS on their website. But uh, by the time this show gets posted, it won't be there. But I did find out that um, this uh, documentary will be coming out on DVD on August the 11th. Ringo, as you know, starred in uh, Mae West's last film called Sextet. All right. A new biopic on Beatles manager Brian Epstein is in the works to be called Midas Man. Director Jonas Ackerlund is involved in this. He's known for working with Paul McCartney for his Live Kisses uh, TV special and also with Madonna for her Grammy Award winning Ray of Light special. And Ackerlund said, this is a very interesting quote, Brian Epstein's story has everything I'm looking for in a story. It's all about Brian's singularity for me. I love that Brian seemed to know every step of the way what no one else knew. He saw things that no one else saw. His vision was astonishing. He created a culture that didn't exist. The film is more like touring Brian's mind and what it was like to be him than how one thing led to another chronologically. I want to bring him back to life. End of quote. And casting has begun on the movie which is expected out in 2021. Joey Molland of Badfinger has been working on a new album with producer Mark Hudson. One track made available online is a remake of the Badfinger classic Baby Blue, which uh, Joey does with Matthew Sweet. Julian Lennon will also be on the new album as well, as will Mickey Dolenz. And the album is due out in the fall. Some of the victims on the business side of the coronavirus include, believe it or not, Cirque du Soleil, who just filed for bankruptcy. So this means we might never get to see the highly successful show Love Again. Who knows? But the people who worked for Cirque du Soleil, the actors involved, have been laid off. So who knows what will happen? once things pick up and this pandemic is over with. But uh, as for right now, they have filed for bankruptcy. Another victim of what's going on uh, because of uh, COVID-19. Have either one of you seen Love in Las Vegas? Oh, yeah. I saw it one time. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. It was fantastic. And I've, I've felt like, you know, bring it to New York, put it on Broadway. And if, you know, the, situation that they're in right now with filing for bankruptcy hey that'd be an instant way to make a lot of money put it on broadway when we're able to go back to the theaters people are going to be knocking the doors down to get back to see theater to see live music and i guarantee you i'm saying i'm guaranteeing um i bet you a dollar to a donut that it's going to be uh, massively successful the beatles love on broadway uh for cirque du soleil do it guys do it (laughs) I certainly hope you're right, Darren. I know that Broadway is shut down for the rest of the year. But I feel so. like that when it opens up, I mean, even from the smallest music club to uh, the biggest concert venue, when we get the all clear, however that ends up happening, 
people are going to be running like to you know like mad to to, to see live entertainment you know and uh you know Cirque du Soleil they don't need me to give them this suggestion you know I've felt all along for years that love should be coming to New York and now would be a great time throw the doors open take off your masks and we can uh, go see Cirque du Soleil's Love on Broadway in New York. Hey, if I moved to New York, I'd be seeing it quite frequently. Right, right. And it would, it would, it would be very exciting every time they'd make a change. Yeah, it's a good reason to go back and see it again. But you've seen it a hundred <laughs> times, but they made another change. <laughs> and also thanks to Darren, who posted this on Facebook, the Westchester Hilton Hotel in Rybrook, New York which for two years, 2015 and 2016, held the Fest for Beale fans, they will be closing their doors permanently, which is a shame because for, the, for those two years, I really enjoyed it there. Of course, it was much closer to my home, but uh, I thought it was a very cozy place to have the Fest for Beale fans. It did have a little bit of a coziness to it, but at the same time, uh, it was a very sprawling hotel, and I remember I needed about a day and a half of the first fest in 2015 there to get my bearings on where my hotel room was in comparison to, uh, you know, all the activities. The fest had been at that hotel uh, in the past. In fact, the very first Beetle Fest that I went to back in the days when it was Beetle Fest was in 1982. And uh, it was at that hotel. And I don't think that was the first one, but it was the last one for a long, long time. And I think they I think they did some rezoning in Westchester where that's why the hotel was in Portchester in 82 and was in Rybrook. They didn't move the hotel. It was just all rezoning. Uh, But, yeah, it was uh, a nice place uh, for the fest to return to in 2015. And in 2016, you know, if uh, some of you who go to the New York, New Jersey uh, Fest for Beetle fans will might remember that for many, many, many years, the fest was held in Secaucus, New Jersey, uh, and they had to come up with a replacement site in 2015 at the last minute because the parking garage, the roof of the parking lot really uh, caved in in Secaucus at what was then uh, had become a Clarion, Uh, used to be a Crown Plaza, used to be a Hilton, that hotel. So at the last minute, Mark and Carol Lapidos had to quickly come up with a hotel to hold the 2015 fest because it couldn't happen in Secaucus. Turned out it never went back to Secaucus. And uh, that's when the Hilton in Westchester and Rybrook came through. And for two years, that was the uh, home for Beetle Fest. Mm. Right. Right. And I know a lot of people said that they found it difficult sometimes to go from their hotel room to where they parked in the parking lot because it was such a huge parking lot. It's a lot of walking. Yeah, my involved. car disappeared. My car disappeared actually the first year <laughs> in 20, 2015. But I helped mix them up because I I lived not too far from uh, from Rybrook, and I went on Friday with one car, parked it Saturday morning, got the car, went back home, and I don't recall why I came back to the hotel on Saturday morning with a different. Car. They put the same tag on on my key, the valet, but they didn't change the plate number. So for about two or three hours on Saturday night, I was convinced that somebody had stolen my car out of the parking lot of that oh, hotel. Uh, until I, we, we, I sat, I spent my Saturday night at that Beetle Fest in one of their uh, little buses, vans, driving around the parking lot looking for my car. Uh, till we found it. It was very spread out and uh, sprawling grounds. Uh, mm. And you could very easily, you know, get lost walking around in all the little parking lots. And I probably spent a way too much time talking about the hotel that's closing. But Yeah. Well, you're not the only one that, that went through that, that kind of thing there. Mm. More news here. We note the passing of country legend Charlie Daniels. At the age of 83 on July the 6th, Charlie suffered from a stroke. He was best known for his hits, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, Uneasy Rider, The South's Gonna Do It Again. Uh, For Beatle fans, we know that Charlie played on Ringo's all-country album, Bukus of Blues. Also, something that I discovered in the last week, uh, singer-songwriter Stephen Bishop, best known for songs like On and On, 
It Might Be You from Tootsie. And the theme to Animal House has a new autobiography coming out called On and Off. In it, he reveals a letter that he got from Apple Records dated August the 1st, 1969, in which he was turned down by the Beatles record label. Stephen submitted a tape with two songs he had written that year, and Apple's letter said that they found the songs unsuitable for their catalog. Stephen remembered the songs were called Picture Her As and Lump in Your Pants. Stephen says the phrase has a different meaning than in what it is now. So Stephen right. Bishop was rejected by Apple, one of the artists rejected because by Because he Beatles. had a lump in his pen. Maybe that's what did him in there, that, yeah. that one song. Those damn <laughs> lumps in their pants, man. <laughs> a couple more news items here. Stella McCartney is involved with something now called Stella Fest in partnership with the National Network to End Domestic Violence, described as a digital festival to stop violence against women. You can bid on virtual events like Meeting Stella or Alicia Keys. Uh, there are Stay Fit programs, cooking lessons, wine tasting happy hours with L.A. Dodgers manager Dave Roberts, to name a few. If you're interested in donating or making bids on these virtual happenings, you can go to priceless.com slash StellaFest. Don't be surprised if you see videos posted online of various artists performing or doing something to show support for this uh, campaign. In fact, Brian Wilson uh, posted a very short video of him at the piano singing Hey Jude a cappella to show his support. Only about 20 seconds of it. One last news item here. Fiona Adams has died. She was a photographer for the Beatles and other rock stars. She took the iconic photo of the Beatles leaping in the air for their EP for Twist and Shout. That photo was taken at an undeveloped bomb site near Euston Station in London for Boyfriend magazine in April of 1963. She also took more photos of the Beatles and staffed pictures of the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, Cilla Black, Adam Faith, Dusty Springfield, and others. In 2009, some of her images were featured in an exhibition of 1960s photography. The exhibit was called Beatles to Bowie and was on display at the National Portrait Gallery. Fiona Adams died from pancreatic cancer, and she was 84. That's all the news I got for you. Okay, thanks, Ken. That was very newsy news. <laughs> now I think it's, you know, it's time to uh, turn our attention to our guest, Dave Morell. Uh, whose latest book, this is volume four in the Dave Morell archives, has just come out. It is Run Out Groove, Inside Capitals, 1980s Hits and Stiffs, covering mostly the period 1980 to 1990. I think there are some earlier and later stories in there too, uh, every now and then. But um, So it's part of a, a series of books Dave's been writing uh, sort of, you know, capturing the life of a record promo guy. And it's, uh, you know, being capital, of course, there's a lot of Beatles involvement. And um, I have a feeling that, you know, while you were involved with an awful lot of artists at this and other labels you've worked at, um, you know, obviously the Beatles have always been sort of the, the uh, Everest for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And being a capital, I didn't know how I would ever fit in. And I couldn't just walk in and say, I, I love the Beatles more than anybody here at Capitol because everybody loves the Beatles as much as the next guy. There's no thermo thermometer. So um, in the first year, I really held back at Capitol and, and listened to what they uh, had to say regarding the Beatles. And they had a Beatles committee where, where they put together projects. And I'd always at least want to have a, an ear to the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, to hear what Capital Product Beatles were talking about. A anything I could get, even a whisper. Uh, never mind, make it into this secret uh, group of men uh, and women who were putting together these Beatle packages. As time went on, and I garnered more respect from the, the home tower, because I didn't know these people uh, being in the New York office, you know, they, they had a liking to me. And finally, um, in 1984... Rolling Stone did the 20th anniversary special on the Beatles' arrival in America. And here I was at Capitol Records as the promotion man in New York. And Rolling Stone reached out to me, a guy named Brant Muborn, to do a story about Beatle collectors. And, uh, you know, it was at this time I 
put forth two other fellas. One guy owned a record store in the village that you guys all know. I thought this would be perfect. You know, the, the, the world of the underground and that kind of interplay, international intrigue, the history of what is the great white wonder? Let's get back to Toronto. I thought it would be uh, appropriate. The other fellow I chose was a big collector who had so much stuff that when I, intru- when I introduced Ethan Russell, a photographer who shot the Beatles, when he saw the, the fellow's collection, he said, this is better than the, what Apple's got. So, uh, but both of those guys uh, backed off. They didn't want to be in the press. They didn't want to draw any attention to themselves. They, they were really low-key players. So the writer uh, said, Dave, will you talk about the Beatles? And I said, oh, man, I'm working at Capitol Records. I can't be talking about bootleg Beatle recordings. No way. <laughs> so uh, th- this is what really opened the door because then uh, they contacted Carter. John Carter, who wrote Incense and Peppermints uh, by the Strawberry Alarm Clock. He was the A&R guy, and he had much success with Tina Turner and so many other acts. And, um, you know, Brent uh, interviewed him, and he basically said, listen, uh, everybody thinks we're, we're coming up with these incredible ideas behind these closed doors, but we're actually just putting together sales packages. And as far as Dave Morrell, we need him out there breaking bands like Iron Maiden, Etc. So uh, this isn't really right for a, like a Beatles collector to be part of this. So uh, you know, with that pat on the back, I, I uh, just went about my way and, and helped in any ways I could to lead further a bit. A co- couple of interesting things happened when the Men Love Avenue album came out. Uh, I, I don't know the right order, but when Men Love Avenue album had come out, you know, I had gone to Liverpool. I'd gone to Men Love Avenue. I'd taken pictures of his house, and they were and they were pretty darn good. So when I got word about this record, they were calling it Man Love Avenue. And I said, <laughs> "Hey, I'm looking at this memo, and it's saying Man Love Avenue, but it's Men Love Avenue." And they're like, "What? Who's this?" I said, "This is Dave Morell. I just came back from Liverpool. It's he lives on Men Love Avenue." So they wouldn't believe me, and they had to straighten it out. So I I got in on this. And I sent them the picture of John's house. Beautiful. I said, this is this has got to be in the package. But uh, they not only boohooed it, but they lost my picture. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> that went on. Did then, you have a negative? When they did the, <laughs> I, I, yes, yes. And I, I, yes, thank you. I'm working on a project. I hope we get a chance to talk about that it has to do with that negative. <laughs> so then the other one was funny was uh, the live in New York City. Uh, and I'm, I hope I'm not getting out of sorts here, but Lennon used to call Bob Gruen, you know, out of focus Gruen. So uh, <laughs> when, when they were taking pictures, uh, looking for photographs of the one to one benefit concert. I, I raised my hand. I said, I was at that show. I was at both shows. I've got, you know, 100 on scene photographs and uh, they didn't want mine. And then his came out. And of course, you know. I thought mine was better, but, you know, they, they went with his. So uh, I, I sort of gave gave up on that. But then the tide turned and the tide turned in such a way that all of a sudden John Lennon projects were becoming the sole uh, proprietor of from Yoko. And so any kind of meeting that had to be done or interaction uh, was now through me, Dave Morrell, you know, and I was like, wow. Dave, could you go over to, to, to meet Yoko and do this? Dave, could you do that? So that was unbelievable. I had met Yoko in 1972 when I you know, was like 20, 19 years old and continued to have met her over the years. And now here I was, you know, being able to meet with her as a representative of Capitol Records to put together projects that she'd sign off on. That was a big thrill, fellas. So working through Capitol and getting up to that, those Beatle projects, that's how really that came about. Mm-hmm. Mm. What was Yoko like to work with? Really wonderful. Uh, when I first met, I'll give you three three different Yokos. When I first met her, uh, I was a boy with a suitcase full of Beatle memorabilia that was uh, enjoyable to me. And I thought that John Lennon wouldn't have seen some of this memorabilia being in England. I don't think he would have seen the little rubber Beatle dolls. I don't think he would. Have, maybe he would. But he wouldn't have seen like uh, the Savage Young Beatles. I had a bunch of stuff in this in this uh, bag to, to show him. For instance, the Beatle bubblegum cards. They had this uh, famous picture of the Beatles. But then some uh, artists uh, did the same card, but had the Beatles with no hair. They were bald. Mm-hmm. And it was really funny. 
So I brought those Beetle bubblegum cards with me. And so now I'm with John Lennon and I pull out this bubblegum card with the Beatles with no hair on it. You know, who would do that? Except the nutty <laughs> kid fan. And Lennon looks at it, he goes, ah, I look, I look so Japanese. He goes, this is hilarious. Go, go show this to Yoko. She's right outside the door there sitting on a chair. So I, I get off uh, th this little stoop I'm on with him in the recording studio. I open the door. There's Yoko on a chair reading a book. And I said, oh, Yoko, uh, John wants me to show you this. She looks up at me like I've interrupted the cup of tea. And she grabs the card. She signed Yoko Ono on it and hands it back to me and looks <laughs> back down on her book. So I. By the time I walked into the studio, I wanted to put it in the, in the garbage can. You know, it's like, OK, uh, I got a Yoko souvenir. So so that was my initial impression. You know, I, I was a boy. She was a, an intellectual woman with her husband. Second time was when I would be around John and we got into a groove about oldies. I was really interested in the early Beatles and, and all the cover songs they had. Where'd they get these singles? Oh, well, that was where I was coming from. And John really opened up on this rock and roll dialogue. He loved to chat about it. And whenever um, she would enter the room, she'd give him some kind of look and he'd clamp down. Like if he wasn't talking about the war or the sometime in New York City politics he was into, which I had no interest in, the army coats, the march, and I was into, interested. If he wasn't talking about that, she brought, she brought him back to being an adult man, you know, it took him away from me when he was around May. We were off the charts talking about all these until the sun came up. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward to the future. You know, I go to meet Yoko and um, she really, you know, she wanted to do the best she could do with the understanding <laughs> she had at the time of uh, John's fans and, and what the collectors of what Capital wanted. So, for instance, there was uh, one time uh, one of the radio stations in the Carolinas was doing a relief food thing, and they wanted to put together a 12-inch of Happy Christmas War is Over. And, and they wrote a letter. That's all they had to do. And she uh, said yes. So I got to help make uh, this limited edition white vinyl uh, Christmas record with her. Another time we were working on... Um, a track with for Men Love Avenue, and uh, I went over there, and uh, we were doing a 12 inch, and I thought, you know, let's put together an outtake, you know, from an album that nobody's heard before. And uh, she said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Well, Angel Baby or Be My Baby, you know, which I had heard uh, at Record Plan. I said they're fantastic, and I said, you know, uh, give a shout over to Record Plan. I'll head over there and, and meet up with them, and we'll just cut this and send it to Capitol." She said, oh, no need. I, I have it here. I said, great. She goes, wait here. I'll be right back. And she uh, went away. And about five minutes later, she came back. And I thought she'd have a two-inch reel tape in her hand. And she had the uh, Roots uh, bootleg album in her hand. And uh, she says, take it off of this. Oh, God. <laughs> I said, well. I said, yeah, that doesn't, I think that's off a cassette to begin with. I'm not sure if it's stereo. It wasn't really what I had in mind, but uh, thank you. So that was fun. Then uh, another time we were doing a, an official Christmas uh, single and sitting with her, she brought out some original artwork that John had done of Yoko and Sean and him. And she showed me all this stuff and asked me what I thought and, uh, you know, so in a cumulative way, a collective soul, you know, uh, we went with this artwork and uh, it was it, it became what the artwork was. And that was so uh, enjoyable. It, it began to get me on her Christmas card list uh, every year. I get a lovely card. But one of the funniest times was I was over to Dakota and, you know, let's just go there for a second. You know, you get out of a car. You go through those gates where John was shot, and it's terrifying to be there. It's like being at Daly Plaza where Kennedy got shot. You get the heebie-jeebies, man. And then you walk underneath that tunnel there, and it's, like, really scary because you're alone, and the sun now doesn't shine there, and it's dark and terrible. And then to the right, you walk up into the concierge's office, and, uh, you know, you're there to see Yoko Studio One. So you go to your right, and then you open this door to your left, and you go in. And it's like being on board the Titanic, this incredible old building that was never worn down. You know, it's always been kept up. And all the rich people stayed on the lower floors because they didn't want to take the steps or elevator. So these are gigantic, you know, uh, rooms with huge ceilings. 
So uh, I'm in there with Yoko and we were putting together a project and she says to me, you know, I worked really hard with you on the Men Love Avenue and, and I'm not seeing anything. We're not seeing anything in the press. There's you know, Rolling Stone magazine, the Billboard magazine. What's the plan, Dave? I said, oh, can I use the phone? She goes, yes. I pick up the phone. I'm sitting at this desk. I call the West Coast. My boss goes, where are you? I said, I'm over at the Dakota with Yoko. He goes, oh, my God, you're around. You not, you not, you not. You must be having a hell of a time. I go, yeah, listen, Yoko's standing right here. We're looking for all the press, all the good stuff going on with Men Love Avenue, Rolling Stone, Billboard. What else, Yoko? Oh, the New York Times. And he says to me on the phone, Dave, it's a catalog item. We're not working it. There's nothing. <laughs> I look at her. I must be turning bright red or purple. <laughs> She's looking at me. You need a pail to throw up? I go, uh, <clears throat> they're going to fax everything over. Thanks for the tea. I have to go now. <laughs> How did so, they decide uh, what to promote and what not to bother with? I mean, you know, a catalog <laughs> album is a catalog album, except that, you know, all the stuff on it is already paid for and amortized. So you would figure if they promote that, they actually will make more profit. Absolutely. And let's think of it this way. You know, I finally got a dream come true. I'm running to NEWFM, Scott Muni, who's Yoko's friend. The day Yo Scott Muni had his child in the next bed in the next room was Yoko having their child. So the connection with Yoko and Scott Muni and John Lennon and the Beatles is right there, man. Mm -hmm. And um, here I am bringing uh, – and I'm Scott's – you know, I've known Scott now for a decade – and he's so happy that Morell's bringing in this stuff. So to bring in a rare John Lennon track, you would think would explode on the radio like a rare Springsteen track at the time. But it, it didn't. It, you know, it, those songs didn't connect in a way that when Scott's show was over, Dennis Elsus couldn't wait to play it, followed by Allison Steele wanting to grab it. It didn't. It just didn't work that way. And um they kind of treated it uh, sort of like a B-side of a single uh, type of thing. In other words, if, if when the one-to-one -one came out, we came out with the Come Together single mm -hmm. and uh, really powered that instead of the, the B-side. So things of that nature. You know, they'd get behind the album talk about it, but it just uh, – we couldn't get airplay on it. And the other thing was that because it was an artist that was going to be bringing us new music, a la Bob Seger – some of the big guns at the time, Poison, Crowded House. It would be a wait and see, Alan, where, you know, if Morell could get any W interested, MMR would come in, you know, Cleveland, uh, you know, Kid Leo, uh, you know, Oedipus up in Boston. Then maybe, you know, if it'd be, it climbed the uh, rock chart, AOR chart at the time, uh, it would have a life. But they couldn't lose getting a John Lennon slot as an ad and not get an active record like The Poison, The Great White, uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, there, there are some people who think that a song like Here We Go Again could have worked as a single or maybe rock and roll people. You know, is it a completely different attitude when you're dealing with archival music from the past that hasn't been released before compared to brand new music from an artist? Does a record label automatically treat it differently? It's, you know, it, you nailed it. So let's say um, we are now fans, second generation, are running the record company. The four of us are at Capitol and we got these tapes. So you picked two very good examples. Now, here is it here we go again or here I go again? Here we go again. Here we go again. I fought over this song. Who wrote that song? John and Phil Spector. Thank you. I don't believe it. I don't believe it <laughs> to this day. I, I confronted Yoko about this. I said, Phil Spector, with the biggest mouth, would have said, I wrote a song with John Lennon. He never said that in any interview. I don't think he wrote that song. I don't believe it to this day. I told Yoko, don't give him credit on this. Somebody fouled up the, the, the work uh, and you're signing off on this. But Phil Spector didn't write this. There's no chance he wrote this. He, he would tell us he wrote this. John would say he wrote a song with Phil Spector somewhere along the line. Somebody proved me wrong on this. But uh, I challenge that uh, to be written by uh, Phil. But thank you. I'm sorry. I ran at the mouth. <laughs> Meanwhile, here, I, here we go. So that song. So now uh, 
again, we're going out to radio with it. It's a song nobody ever heard before. It's John Lennon and Phil Spector. Phil Spector did the, you know, was going to do the rock and roll album. I don't know how many songs he finally ended up doing for the that record. But that was such a great combo. Uh, and, and let me say this to you, fellas. Years earlier, I ran with uh, Philly's, uh, the Spectre Warner label. Phil Spector signed to Warner Brother Records. So I ran with a Phil Spector sh- written the Cher Harry Nielsen song. We went nowhere with that. I worked with a Phil Spector produced uh, uh, Dion album, uh, Leonard Cohen. Nothing for, from, from Phil. So again, going out with a Phil Spector on a new song, Phil didn't have the juice like us Beatle fans do. Like Phil Spector and John Lennon have a song together. Where's radio, man? This is hot. This is what a story we have here. Hmm. I don't think it, it played out as well as we all wish it would have. Now, on Rock and Roll People, Another example, and I can only talk from my own history, Johnny Winter. My God, if you ever saw Johnny Winter, you know, you saw something. This guy was a wild man at that silver hair halfway down his ass, the albino eyes, that rock and roll, that growl, those blues, the volume. Johnny Winter, man, he was a New York favorite. He lit up uh, the Fillmore East. So uh, when he re- when he put out the John Lennon track, he got airplay. Mm-hmm. You know, he got airplay. But when John Lennon put it out, he didn't get airplay. Go figure that one out. And I went with that with full uh, guns blazing. Look at this. We've been waiting for this, right? Like, <laughs> no. So it was another one that didn't work. So you we know- couldn't get loud enough to get a top 50 rock track, uh, which would translate, let's just say, uh, into some kind of press to, to, to for somebody at Rolling Stone or for Allen at the New York Times to do a piece about uh, Capitol putting out these treasure songs that the world's never heard of, John Lennon doing Johnny Winter's cut or John Lennon's uh, Phil Spector song. I guess it wasn't that interesting to, to press radio and w- whatever media formats we have. I would mm. jump in here a bit because uh, I was at WFUV in the mid '80s. I was in, you know, this was the days. Now it's it's it's, it's comparing apples to oranges. W and WFM uh, to WFUV. We were a college station, but we had a big signal and we covered the entire tri-state area. And as a Beatle fan, uh, and and most everyone on the staff were Beatle fans, or uh, to some extent, you know, when these records came out live in New York City and then Menlo Avenue. They got significant airplay on FUV. I remember vividly uh, getting the 12 inch single come together in advance of live in New York City. And we played that. We, we wore that out. Of course, we had no we had to, we didn't have to answer to anyone. You know, the program director was a student. The music director <laughs> was a student. We all were on the <laughs> same page. This was college radio. Uh, this was mega college radio in New York City. Again, a drop in the bucket compared to WNEW FM. But what I remember about Men Love Avenue was that uh, I was really intrigued by the album, but I always, I never exactly knew what the album was trying to be. There were n- no notes or minimal notes explaining what these tracks were. But nonetheless, you know, um, we spun it fairly often. We didn't play it like it was, you know, previously unreleased material, but uh, I found it a little difficult to talk about from time to time because I didn't exactly know what the tracks were and the source and what the whole overall feel of Men Love Avenue is. But hearing you talk about it, trying to get it played on any WFM and whatnot, and I'm thinking, there I am up in the Bronx on WFP, <laughs> you know, with these records, uh, you know, foaming at the mouth and playing them. You know what appeals to me about this conversation is when Nobody Told Me came out. I thought that was a half-baked record that they didn't finish. It sounded like a demo from Lennon. It, to me, it was just not polished. And having worked the songs we're talking about, the Here I Go Again, the, the, those tracks, uh, and then see Nobody Told Me, go up, go, you know, make it. I was mad because I thought, what's up with this? This, this song is no better than um, the, the things we were putting out. You know, in other words, I thought that uh, anything that would come close to Nobody Told Me Later on, as far as quality, we'd get a real shot at, and um, because I, I, I just, I just thought that, and and we, we, we didn't get it. But thanks to you at college, I mean, you know, those were the that's magnifico. That's what made that so much so great that you could play anything you wanted all the time. Ah, uh, those were the days. Mm. You know, bouncing off what Darren just said, Men Love Avenue was a very tough album to figure out. 
because the second side of it was all walls and bridges rehearsals. I wouldn't even call them outtakes. They were more like run throughs, you know. So how was the material selected from that? Do you have any information about that with a mixture of that? No, I'm with you guys. And you were just going to say it. you were just going to say it. And I jumped in to say even putting the Warhol picture on the cover it d- it didn't work. It was a mishmash. It wasn't thought out properly. And yet, you know, looking back speculatively, I, I don't know that they tried to push it out to meet some kind of a, a date, you know, like a certain date in history that it had to come out at that time. Uh, I was not involved in it. So so, no, I, I don't know. But I will say this. When it came to the one to one, that was a whole different animal because uh, here you had the uh, Pioneer Electronics, those laser discs and Sony. The, the, there was a huge budget behind that one, which I thought, you know, if we could anchor on to something which we weren't able to anchor on to w- with the Men Love Avenue, even even like, for instance, with the Christmas record, you know, John was getting more and more play each and every year, but they weren't treating it like, let's make this a chart hit and bring it up to number one the next year and sort of play that that chart game. But on the one to one, there was so much money involved with that. And they and they got out Lincoln Center and they put out nice invitations and Yoko and Sean and Julian came and Scott Muni and they presented that so well. We thought we'd really have a, a, a big John Lennon piece at that time. And uh, and that didn't work. That was the first, uh, uh, the live in New York City stuff in 85 was, that was the first where uh, the Lennon estate was back on Capitol, right? Yeah. I, I want to say this, though. You ever notice this? I don't know if the collectors talk about this, but when that, when the one-to-one benefit concert ran over the radio, uh, the mix was entirely different. So if you listen to the FM broadcast of the song Imagine mm-hmm. versus the Capitol album of, of Imagine, it's two different songs. You know, it's like completely different. It's so much better on the FM uh, broadcast uh, tapes would you know I, i've always asked this question and i've never gotten an answer but most of the recordings from lennon live in new york city are from the afternoon show as opposed you know, to the I, evening one which is which is far superior you know as yeah. a performance it, you know back in those days we used to tape record the shows when we went to them so uh i haven't uh a and b them but of course in the early show uh john stopped uh uh, one of the songs and said, welcome to the rehearsal and started it over again. And of course, the late show, when that thing started to catch fire and he went into Hound Dog mm. and then to give peace a chance, that was really incredible. You know, uh, I, I thought that was really incredible. But, you know, it t- that turned out to be a negative thing for the estate because uh, the fellows in the in Elephant's Memory did that all for free. You know, it was for a benefit. Nobody took any money. And, and when they put the, the album out and the video out, they they complained they never got paid. I think that right. may be what's holding up a a Blu-ray like reissue, or a, you know, why the thing isn't in print now. Although um, we keep hearing that it will be back. They said that Jack Douglas worked with Yoko. That uh, they got both shows plus the rehearsals at Butterfly Studios plus rehearsals at the Fillmore East. And with that in mind, I, I want to double team up and put out a book, a fans' perspective of what it was like uh, that day, because we we had made up Beetle Butcher. Uh, t-shirts we got a peddler's license we mm-hmm. had tickets to the shows uh, we had a chaotic crazy day man you believe it or nuts fellas and i mean this believe it or nuts um between shows n- n- none of the kids had anything to do but wander around madison square garden right mm-hmm. so we're wandering around before the second show and alan klein himself was uh standing outside and they were giving away the 121 dollar tickets for free because nobody had the money to buy them. So they got stuck with all of them. And that's how we got into the late show with the $121 ticket. We were able to get one of the tambourines that were on the seats. <laughs> oh, wow. man. I wish I was there <laughs> that moment. Uh, well, and, $121. And by, $121. I found a photograph. I may be off my rocker uh, because it may be everybody knows this. But I found my pictures uh, that day. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send them to you. And there's one where behind John, he's got that guitar that he's wearing uh, on the roof of get of the uh, Apple, you know, the uh, the Apple rooftop performance, and the and the and the guitar on the back of the Revolver album before he, you know, stripped it to the to the white. He had that guitar on stage with him, but just didn't reach for it. Hmm. 
So he had a couple of fine – he had a Firebird guitar up there too. So I've got some interesting uh, you know, shots I want to be able to share if and when that package ever comes out. Yeah. When I spoke to Jack Douglas a couple of years ago, he told me that there's a problem with the video end, not the audio. That's uh, what's holding it up. So I don't know specifically what, but I know there have been plans, and I'm sure it's going to come out. Yeah, hope so. Yeah. So but just I, to clarify, I just want to clarify one thing. So is it because of you, Dave, that Angel Baby made Men Love Avenue? I, you know, I would say yes. I, I can't think of who else could, could have picked it. I picked it when I was there with her, and I picked it because, you know, I got the chance to hear it with just John Lennon in the room and, and Jimmy Iovine. And it rattled my cage to this moment. It, nothing was more powerful than uh, the day I went to the record plant. I got a phone call. John was looking for the 45 of Just Because by Larry Williams, and who was his hero. His uh, hero. That was Slow that Dwight Price. Yeah. Uh, but this was Larry Williams' version. Oh. It was a Larry Williams' version. And Larry did Bad Boy, Slow Down, Dizzy Miss Lizzie. So, so he wanted Larry's version, not Lloyd's version. And uh, so bringing that record to him, he loved Larry's rasp. That's how he got the This Boy rasp going he, he told me that but this particular day when i brought the record up to record plant he handed it to may to write the words for him and he said uh, come on in and uh, he introduced me that day to jimmy iovine he was 16 years old he's still my friend today and so he says jimmy play dave uh, the tracks so there we are me and john lennon i don't even belong there fellas i'm shaking and jimmy <laughs> and uh they hit the play button. Now, this is a two-inch tape. This is in a recording studio. You're not at home with your parents. John Lennon is standing there, and this volume is going to go to 11. Bum, 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 bum. And then, you know, Angel Baby comes on, and I cannot believe it. He didn't tell me what song it was going to be. I love that record. And he loved that record. He loved the B-side even more because he thought it was it went off speed that they didn't cut it right. Check out the B-side. It's called Give Me Love, like the George Harrison tune. And um, he loved this. I was looking at him. I was shaking because it was so perfect to hear it this way with him and uh, and having him look at me like, what do you think uh, when you heard I was doing a rock and roll album? What do you think of this? <laughs> and it was like getting hit by a jet airplane starting the engine. I was overwhelmed. And then it didn't come out. You know, yeah. imagine I hear Angel Baby and he plays me Be My Baby. This is in October of 74. I tell people like my friend Alan, I tell people, where do you hear this? This is unreal. On February, the uh, rock and roll album comes out. <laughs> Both <laughs> songs are not on it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you but, had to uh, buy the Morris yeah. Levy version. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which was worth it for those two songs. <laughs> Yeah. Huh. Could you just run through in order the record companies you worked for chronologically? Yeah, sure. I, first, I started in the Wii Warehouse in Carlstadt, New Jersey, picking and packing records. And then the big job in the summer warehouse was to get out of the heat. And there was a kid in a cage, a cage with uh, promo uh, albums and singles and mailings to DJs. So uh, come September, I started in June. Come September, the kid who was in charge of that moved to... Uh, Wanted to go to college. And I had quit college to get to this warehouse. He was leaving this warehouse to get to college and get somewhere. So uh, that enabled me to get into the promotional room, which enabled me to get into the air-conditioned office. And then I'd be at the uh, WIA meetings every week uh, with all the salesmen and the promotion men and this whole world that was very exciting. And uh, I had done a couple of good promotions as a kid where Atlantic was interested in hiring me. But uh, the opportunity for Warners came along. So uh, as a 21-year-old, I was a Warner promotion man. So I went from Warners, uh, and my boss who hired me through the Wea Warehouse, watched me grow as a, as a boy, uh, brought me over to RCA. He, was the, he went to become the first black vice president of promotion at RCA who oversaw a country music division. This was a big deal. Wow. So I, I joined RCA. Uh, that broke up after a year or two of great fun. You know, Elvis was on the label and Harry Nielsen and Bowie and Lou Reed. Uh, I, I went over to 20th Century Fox to be in, to work with film, film soundtracks, 
we hit it out of the park, fellas, with one of the century's biggest hits called Star Wars and one of the biggest thrills of my lifetime. And I mean, arm wrestling, another promotion man to the ground, fun times, wrestling fun, was when uh, a classical record by John Williams gets played on WABC ahead of Miko's disco version because he miko remember he was doing all those sure. covers so it moved from 20th and then um, things were so great i got a call from clive davis who was interested in soundtrack stuff to come and work with him and i'll tell you hand on all of us i thought i was going to harvard university with the most smartest man on the planet earth and it didn't work out that way for two years it was insane crazy i had the triumphant uh, imagine trying to stay mentally uh, sober working with Lou Reed, Patty Smith, and Iggy Pop. Hello! The next day, <laughs> holding hands with Barry Manilow. Come on, man. <laughs> this was insanity. And then I got the phone call I always dreamed of, you know, uh, from Maureen O'Connor, who's still my friend today, who was married to Stephen Priest of Sweet, who just passed away in the last 90 days. She mm-hmm. called me up. Uh, she had been dating Dennis Elsus at the time from NAW and said, we got an opening at Capitol. And so I, I ran over and I really uh, looked up to the sky and said, if it is to be. And uh, 10 years later, I, I, I spent 10 years there. Uh, it was a dream come true. I had a lot of fun. And um, I hope it comes off in the book. Did you go from Capitol to Wyndham Hill then? No, I, uh, I went over to Geffen. Uh, this Al Corey guy, uh, you know, who was in charge of... Um, uh, Capital in the early days, you know, he looked like Sonny Bono. He's in all the pictures with all of the guys. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he brought me into Geffen, and you know, imagine uh, Aerosmith, Olivia Newton-John, Guns N' Roses, Peter Gabriel, Cher. It, it, it never ended. It was so much fun, and and being a New York guy was out of this world because as the three, as the four of us are on the phone right now, this is the way you know four promotion men would be talking before a conference call started. But the guy, you know, in St. Louis or uh, in, in some of the other areas, uh, they never got stadium size shows at the time. They never if you worked at Arista, Clive Davis never went to St. Louis. You know, you never met the guy. They had a playback party for Alan Parsons. You know, they didn't do that in St. Louis. And they had a party for Barry Manilow on the roof of the St. Regis Hotel. They didn't do it in St. Louis on the roof of the hotel. Mm. So it was harder, tough. But more fun if you could if you could hang on and, and, and work with with what you had to work with. And uh, I'm grateful that I made it through. And I'm here talking to you, fellas. Yeah. Yeah. Darren. Yeah. Well, I would, yeah. I think I was going to actually then ask Dave about 85 middle 80s. McCartney comes back to Capitol Records in the U.S. and buys like us. The single is uh, his first release back with Capitol. Were you uh, involved at all uh, with anything having to do with Paul's return, promoting the Spies Like Us single, uh, or anything, uh, you know, remotely related to that? Yeah. The next step, press to play? Yeah, yeah. As you can imagine, I'm working at Capitol. We've lost John, and uh, the, the years are rolling, and we're working on these, you know, kind of reissues and these packages. And then we get this call. You know, a, a, a call from Baskar Menon, the whole staff that we've signed Paul McCartney. I fell off the chair. I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't want to win the lottery. This was more important to me, you know, because this was not going to be meeting Paul at a meet and greet, sign a book, take a quick picture. This was going to be working, not meeting, working with Paul McCartney. Dave's our New York promotion man. It's like, oh, my gosh. So the hoopla was this is coming down fast. You know, there's the, we don't even have a new picture of Paul. We don't have uh, anything to go on other than it's this movie called Spies Like Us with Chevy Chase and uh, Ackerwood. I might have the actors wrong, but, you know, it's really great movies coming out. Uh, highly uh, looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's coming like in a month. You know, it's coming right up on you. And Paul's got the song uh, from the movie and it's called Spies Like Us and the movie's called Spies Like Us. I was like, oh, my gosh, you're, you're kidding me. Fantastic. Fantastic. You know, rallied up the troops, all the NEW gang, all the, all the radio, uh, hopefully FUV, all of, the, all of the gang, and said, wow, we're going to go see the, the movie. Paul, uh, hopefully Paul will come. Maybe Paul McCartney will be there. This is the New York premiere. All of the, it, it, no, it wasn't the premiere. It was a uh, screening. And um, 
all the important people uh, that would have uh, been in the movie would come. You know, the, the director, the, uh, the people who see themselves for the first time in the movie. A full run through. Here it is. Capitol Records. And we're all excited. And Paul doesn't show up and the movie's starting. And I'm not laughing like I did for Animal House. And, you know, I just wasn't laughing during this movie. And um, I'm wondering why they didn't start the movie with the song. And then as it's, it's going on, the, the song's not in the movie. And then the movie ended and the song wasn't in the movie. And I'm all sitting there like, this is a gag. This is either a gag or the, it's the movie finished. This We're seeing a, an experimental version of this motion picture. And then as the credits come on and people are all looking for their own names, uh, this, uh, you know, like instrumental piece, which was really the tail end of the song, plays for a little while. And then the song comes on. By then I look around, there's six people. <laughs> Everybody ditched it. it. Had no impact with the movie whatsoever. The movie I maybe had an impact. But... That record went, you know, top 10, and it had, mm-hmm. and that would be his last top 10 for probably 25 years, which is easy to say you were part of the last top 10, but it was very disappointing. It broke my heart to, to not take it to number one. How could we fail Paul McCartney? How could we fail with a brand new Paul McCartney song, fresh from a movie, no matter if the movie's a bomb or not? It doesn't matter. Uh, but we just, it just didn't stick around long enough to have that life that uh, a record like that would need. In other words, the early birds would be on it, but three three uh, months into it, when you're still trying to get up those charts, those early birds that went on it were now uh, bagging it. They weren't sticking with it so that we could achieve that top five, uh, three, two, one spot. So we didn't really, we didn't get it, but, uh, and I never had met Paul. I never heard a thing, whether he was happy or sad or whatever. And then uh, the next moment was uh, when we had the Radio City Music Hall luncheon for him for Press to Play. And uh, I knew this was going to be a big deal. I knew I was going to meet Paul McCartney. It was so insane. I was so a uh, wreck that I had to bring a Polaroid camera. I had to have instant gratification. <laughs> <laughs> I could not wait for somebody to take a picture and go develop it. I wasn't going to wait. <laughs> so uh, I brought my camera with me and um, I brought the Beetle Butcher cover and I was a wreck because you can't pull this stuff on uh, in, a, in that kind of atmosphere. You know, you can't do it. You got to be professional. So slow down, Jack. Cool out, man. Cool down, boy. Cool down. So um, we're at Radio City Music Hall and I'm standing around this uh, group of, of guys that was Baskar Menon, uh, Don Zimmerman, the president of the company, Rupert Perry, you know, all these really high end guys. And um, I could feel behind me some kind of action and light bulbs and things of this nature. And as my head was turning, boom, Paul McCartney was like right on us. And he was right there. You know, the guy in Hey Jude film. He's looked at me, looked up at me with that. Hey, Jude. I was like, whoa, here he is. There's Paul McCartney. And he started the conversation with these guys and because he knew them. And that was so cool. He had his best days with these fellas. It was all all hand slap and ha, ha, ha. And um, and then they said, to Paul, this is I was the only outsider. And they said, Paul, this is Dave. And he's our New York promotion man. And he looked at me and he you know, shook my hand and said, hey. And it was, you know, just so great because uh, I immediately didn't have to introduce him to somebody else. I was like able to stand there and just take this in. And it's funny because on the album is a song called Move Over Busker. It's about like busking in the in the subway system, you know, playing the guitar, collecting a few changes, some change, move over busker. And um, so Paul says, how do you like the record? What do you like? And I said, oh, I, I love move over Baskar because Baskar <laughs> Menon was standing next to me. <laughs> so Baskar Menon looks to me like, what's wrong? <laughs> Everybody looks at Baskar Menon. Paul's looking at Baskar Menon. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized it was move over busker, not move over Baskar. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was uh, now a beat red and he wants to run. But uh, no, that was the uh, the first. Then uh, he, he went around the room and met people. And then I got to bring him around the room and introduce him to the Mark Chernoffs, the, all the radio people that were that were there. Uh, there was like 250 people and, and it was great. And he was so gracious 
He answered every question. He put his arm around you. He smiled. He did the whole Beatle thing. And he wanted to. This guy wakes up wanting to meet you. I'm telling you. And I felt that. Meanwhile, um, I wandered away. And I'm standing with Linda, who I just met. And this was so down to earth and so easygoing. I felt like I was with a school student, friend of mine. She was so nice. And we were with Danny Fields, who uh, had grown up working with Gloria Stavers at 16 Magazine. He went on to be an a and r guy signing the MC5. They just made a documentary uh, about Danny. So Danny was the McCartney's friends. And I knew Danny from Hits Magazine. And so we were gathered. So out of the blue, Linda says, hey, anybody got anything to smoke? And I said, yeah. And uh, so we went upstairs at Radio City Music Hall. We snuck up the steps. We went into the balcony. And we rolled up a doobie and we're smoking it. And Linda says, wow, I I had such great memories here. I I used to come to the movies here with with the girls at school. I remember dancing in the aisles, seeing the movie. Dave, did did you ever see a movie here? I said, yeah, I remember seeing the Yellow Rolls Royce. She goes, oh, what a piece of shit. I go, oh, well, I liked it. I thought it was a good movie. She goes, "Ah, come on. I go, oh, okay, come on, you're right, stunk, okay. So we're loaded, and uh, we go back down the <laughs> stairs. And uh, as I'm about to push away and go into the back corner where I belong, uh, she grabs me by the arm and says, you're coming with me. And then Paul looks up at us and says, these two got the munchies, these two have the munchies, sit down. And uh, now I'm sitting with Paul McCartney. And after the wonderful chatter about the new album and uh, – Everybody was uh, eating and he had these special pizzas from uptown that, that he was in the Linda were eating and they were taking the rest of them to out to Long Island with them. But as he talked about the new album, he had a box with them on the floor and he was signing every one of them and you know, he kept signing, signing, signing. And then it ra- then it sort of like uh, wandered. And he says to me and this came from him. I didn't instigate this. He said, so, Dave, you know, what's going on? Uh, and I said, oh, you know, this, the, new be- the new catalog has the new be- this Beatles album. Now, forgive me whether we're sessions or rarities. I confuse that. But uh, I said, what do you think of it? And uh, he says, no, 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 no. That, that's not Now that I'm here, that, that's not happening. I said, it's, it's in the catalog. The, the fellows are soliciting. No, it's not happening. I said, well, what, what about, uh, you know, the songs that people have never heard? What about the songs on the record, like uh, I'm the Walrus and Strawberry Fields? And he says, what, take 18, take 20? Who came up with that number? I said, I, I don't know who came up with that number or why it's on here, uh, you know, uh, but it's pretty cool. And he goes, you know what? When you go home, listen to the last one, the one we put out. That's the one, man. That's the one. <laughs> Forget these other ones. I go, all right, I'll, I'll consider, I'll, I'll think about that. And I said, what about songs that, uh, you know, we've heard uh, the Beatles do, but um, they, they never did, like uh, Come and Get It. I said, uh, you know, I heard your demo of it, Paul, and uh, Badfinger did it exactly like that, exactly. He goes, that's right. I told him, fellas, you want to have a hit? Do it exactly this way, exactly. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, that's cool. So I said, what about songs um, that people uh, that, you know, nobody's ever heard before uh, by the Beatles? He says, name one. I said, that means a lot. And all of a sudden he put his neck up real high and grabbed his Adam's apple and goes, can't you see? He goes, rubbish. I wouldn't want anybody to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we laughed our asses off, had a joyful time. And, um, and that, that was my, exp- my first experience to really be with him. So then... Of course, um, the moment came and I reach for it and I pull up the Beatle butcher cover and he looked at it and he goes, wow. He said, if you didn't have this signature on here, which was two Dave from John Lennon, he said, if you didn't have the signature on here, I'd nick this off you. I haven't seen one of these in years. It's beautiful. And I was so knocked out. And so, um, he signed it and, uh, you know, we got a chance to talk about it, and he talked to the table about with how value, you know, how valuable it was, but what it was all about. It was really charming and really wonderful. And then we got to to work on the record. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow! I should, I should probably ask you about your adventures with the dreaded Albert Goldman. It's in yes. the book. <laughs> yeah. Now, Alan, and forgive me in advance, and I thought about this through uh, two years of writing it, uh, that your name isn't in there. And uh, there's a story to that. Uh, uh, In the small courses I took, 
in the small time I spent here in college out here in California, uh, there was a big mention about keeping people's names out of books and driving the narrative forward, et cetera. I won't get into it, but forgive me. It is you. You're great, and I love you. Well, I, you know, uh, you, you said you're, so, you're, you're a pal from the New York Times, so I've been getting actually a bunch of emails from people saying, um, is that you? <laughs> oh, oh, so uh, I, that's fine. I'm going to but, declare it on every interview and everywhere. It doesn't I mean, matter uh, to me. You know, I, well, <laughs> let me just say that it, I, I spent 10 years at Capitol, and the man next to me, uh, was the local promotion man and his name's not in the book 10 years with him so, you know less than a feet away so okay i i thank you all right so alan from the new york times so uh, a real intellectual guy i mean the new york times and uh, besides that connection he's an intellectual guy and i'm not and he's smart really smart and intelligent just read alan's book and uh, he approached me that, that he said, Dave, I heard you on the radio and I've got a recording of it. And I said, hey, let's hang. And from that moment on, we'd meet over at our watering hole, the old Pescatore Veneto on 56th Street. You know what it was, Dave? You know what it actually was? I was at EMI to interview one of the classical guys because I was classical writer. And, <laughs> and the, the guy I was supposed to interview was out with Tony Caronia, their classical promo guy, um, basically having lunch and got drunk and forgot about the interview. So like I had been sitting there for like an hour and the secretary kept coming out and saying, uh, are you okay? Anything I can get you? And then I was just feeling like, not pissed off, but I, I, I thought, you know, okay, I'm just going to gonna mess about here. And I said, so all I want to know is when you guys are going to release the single of Leave My Kitten Alone, because there was a rumor <laughs> of that. <laughs> and she said, um, let me get you Dave Morell. And I thought, <laughs> Dave Morell? Is that the guy who was on the Howard Smith show in 1971? And, and you came out and I asked you that then and you said, yeah. You know, I, I figure everybody probably asked you that because, you know, everyone has a tape of that. <laughs> so, thank thank so, you. So that's how I remember it happening. It's kind of funny when, you know, two people have memories and, and sometimes they're different, but they're like each person's memory. So it is what it is. That is gorgeous. And remind me before we split today, I want to tell you about a record I want to do with Yoko uh, with, uh, that you just touched on uh, without knowing you touched on. So yeah. um, Alan and I are now hanging out and uh, just having a great time. And thank you for mentioning that about uh, the leave my kitten alone and talking to that girl, because when I worked at Capitol, uh, there seemed to be the shoe off of, of uh, Beatle people, like fans would come up for something. There, there was nobody to go to. They'd be like, uh, there's nobody here for a poster. Uh, you know, please come back. And being a fan and, and as, a, as a kid going up to Apple Records and trying to score something, I wanted everybody to be treated differently in the way that I was treated. So I'd say to the girl at the front desk, anybody calls here about the Beatles, send it to me. I, I, I got five minutes. They want, and, and I used to have a, a, a deal where every Friday some of these kids would come up with their parents. I'd send them home with 20 posters and, and, and picture cover, whatever they wanted, because I wanted to be treated that way. So by se setting the story up and telling you that, one day I get the phone call, Dave, Al Albert's on the phone. I'm like, who's Albert? And it was Albert Goldman. And um, this guy had done a scathing book on Elvis Presley. It was a piece of crap. And uh, I didn't want nothing to do with this guy. And um, he said he was he said to me on the phone that John Lennon was the truest icon of the of the truest sense in a James Dean world that John, unlike Elvis, had no dirty laundry inside joke, no dirty laundry. He, uh, you know, showed himself everything he, he, he spoke of, uh, spoke out loud about it. He's truly the one. And I've got everyone on board from Howard Smith and every uh, Yoko. Every, we, we've got everybody on board for this book. And uh, I said, OK, uh, let's meet. And I met him and he was like Ben Franklin. You know, he was this uh, monotone guy that gnawed on my ears because he talked in this way that he wasn't a Beatle fan. He could give a crap about playing a Beatle record. He was just into these, uh, you know, mindless, organic 
brain things he was on about John Lennon that I had no interest in with him. About John Lennon's role in life and intellectually speaking and college speaking. It's like, I got a headache, man. So I said to him, what, what's up? And he said, let me show you a few things I have. And he opens up a safe. And in the safe, the first thing he had was this newspaper article from like 1961 of uh, Alan Williams' flat and the beatniks hanging around and Lennon on, on the floor and this article about uh, John Lennon and these guys. And I thought, whoa, that is cool, man. Where does a guy like this find this? And how come we don't know about this? So, th- so he had that. Then he had uh, letters, uh, John Lennon's diaries that he said John had written in Japan and sent back to the Dakota in an envelope. And on the envelope, it said on the left-hand side, it's to me, from me, don't throw out. And so he emerged with these diaries and showed me this stuff. And I, without a doubt, this was John Lennon's, and I couldn't believe he had this. And then he told me a story that somebody had taken this from the Dakota, uh, an established personnel over there, and they got uh, caught and uh, this uh, escaped, and he had it and was going to use it in research for his book. He then had a cassette uh, that he played me of songs that uh, I d- he didn't know existed. I, I didn't know anything about this or how he could have gotten these personal cassettes of John Lennon. I was flabbergasted and um, I was really dizzy. I, I thought to myself, how in the hell does a non Beatles fan get this stuff? How do these hot dog writers get this stuff? How do they get so much money? Who pays these nuts so much? to money to write books on people that they don't know nothing about. I, I couldn't believe it. So um, he says to me, listen, here's what I, here's what I'm looking for. You know, a lot of capital sales information um, on the records. I said, Oh, that's, you know, that's nothing. And uh, that's in an encyclopedia probably. Uh, he says, but I'm really interested in Yoko and I want to get to, uh, I want to do some research on her uh, that brings it up to when she meets John and, um, that's where I'm at. So let's, let's split here and we'll meet again. And it occurred to me when I left him that I had this Everson Art Museum, Syracuse uh, portfolio that they, John and Yoko did. And in this portfolio uh, thing that you open up like a poster were all these uh, little articles about Yoko before she met John. They were all like from the New York Times and all these uh, and they were all dated. And there were like 40 of them laid out on this big sheet, like the Beatles White Album poster. And uh, I knew he never saw this. So I decided instead of handing it to him, I would photos that each little article on Yoko. So it looked like I had 50 pages of research instead of this one piece of thing. And uh, I, I got in contact with him again. And he says, listen, I'll, I'll put your name in the book. I'm going to pay you. I said, whoa, slow down, Charlie Horse. No, thanks. I don't want no credit. I don't want no dough. But you're not a Beatle fan, and you got all this research material, so I'll work with you for that research material. And he goes, what do you got? And I started to show him. He flipped. He flipped. So, you know, he, 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 he loved it. And then he was getting into this uh, more deeper stuff. And I said, I can't handle this. i got to get somebody over here who, 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 who will understand, you know, what, what's going on here. They, nobody will believe me if I tell them what I saw and what's going on. So I thought, Alan. You got to come, Alan, Alan from the New York Times, please help me. You can, you can, you're the arm wrestler with this guy. And so uh, Alan came and we spent uh, an afternoon with uh, Albert and uh, I'll let Alan pick up the story for a moment because I know at the end of this story, a year later or so, he called, he spoke to him for an interview again. So take it, Alan. Right. Well, yeah, we that was that was quite a trip that day. Uh, I think what you wanted from me was to sort of assess whether he was being straight with you when he said that he was going to write a respectful biography of John, not a trashing in his Elvis style, you know. But it was really hard to tell, you know. I mean, I asked him a lot of questions and stuff, and uh, he insisted that it was going to be like a, a like almost a scholarly book with with you know a whole you know apparatus at the end with um, you know source listings and all kinds of stuff. None of which it turned out to be, of course. But I also remember, you know, he played us a bunch of stuff, 
And the stuff he started playing was really common. You know, it was like, I am the walrus without the orchestral stuff and you <laughs> know, things that were out on bootleg. But then suddenly there was serve yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I remember we both flipped out, you know, no one had heard, you know, serve yourself had not been bootlegged. And, uh, you know, that was kind of new. And, and, and that was, you know, that was sort of exciting to hear that especially because of the talking at the beginning and end and stuff, you know? And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't know what to make of it, but then when the book came out uh, and was what it was, I went to my editors and I said, I want to talk to this guy because I actually had talked to him during his research and what he told me he would do is totally the opposite of what he did, <laughs> you know, plus reading it. I, I only had a weekend to read it because you know, the, the interview was going to be a Monday and they didn't get me the book till Friday. And just on a, you know, cursory read, I had like 10 typed pages of errors. You know, Love Me Do came out on a 78. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Julian's birthday was wrong. The address of the Ed Sullivan Theater was wrong. He calls Wendy Carlos, who lived less than a mile away from him, he called her uh, the Japanese creator of an album called Sonic Seasonings, which was an electronic album that apparently <laughs> John liked. You know, I mean, it was just uh, it was it was just insane. And um, so I interviewed him and he uh, he wasn't really prepared to talk to someone who knew the stuff. And he didn't remember that I had come with Dave that day. And he was in Spain at the time. So when I told him I had been there and that, you know, he played Serve Yourself. And he said, oh, well, Fred Seaman said he got that on some bootleg scene. How's that, Dave? Is that a good album? <laughs> <laughs> uh, top notch. <laughs> and I said, no, no, Albert, um, uh, it did not come out until eight months after we spoke. And he said, well... I'm in Spain. If I was at home, I could look up my records and we could have a grand old time. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I think you have a diminishing filter on your mind. You have no sympathy, <laughs> you have no sympathy for John Lennon at all. And, and I'm saying, what, me? I have no sympathy. I didn't write your book, man. <laughs> you have no sympathy for John Lennon. But, uh, and then his, then his publicist called up and said, so... Um, did you get Albert this morning? And I said, yeah, oh, yeah, I think I got him. <laughs> genius. So, yeah, so that was fun. But, um, that is genius. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, right after that went down, I got called by uh, Elliot Mintz. Mm. He said, uh, hey, you know, this Rolling Stone thing's come out. You know, all this stuff's going on. And, uh, you know, can we meet? And so I met with him over at that Aguardian room at the Plaza Hotel. He wanted to go into the, eat where John ate, sit where John sat. And uh, here he was saying, you know, uh, you know, all the stuff's out there. You're our guy. If you see any of this, you let us know. <laughs> it was really uh, being put under that gun there uh, for a bit with, with, with them. But so fascinating, you know, this cloak and dagger stuff, right? Uh, yeah. Dealing with the Beatles stuff. Uh, it's really, really fun. Uh, and, and it's all worked like Alan started by saying, anybody here about leave my kitten alone? He's talking to the girl at the desk and here's how uh, <laughs> uh, Goldman uh, reached me. You know, and on that leave my kitten alone, you know, the guy um, at Capitol uh, who put that sing who was creating that single to be put out, there was like 100 made. And uh, I was able to get like maybe 10. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, you know, somebody bootlegged it. And now, you know, I mean, who knows? That's that's what makes make collecting so tough for all of us that you just don't know uh, unless you unless you're that genius to know uh, what you're getting anymore. That, and that's why on the George Harrison autograph on the Beetle Butcher cover, unless I was there to see his hand put it on there and to see what he's wearing and the mood he was in, it wasn't going to happen. And I had Dave Herman begging me to give it to him that he was, cause he was George's friend to say, I'll be with George tonight. I'll take care of it. But there's no way I was going to let that happen. Yeah. You should have gone with him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. I thought you, um, did you ever get George's autograph no. on that? Okay. No, no. He, uh, I saw him at the rock and roll hall of fame dinner. Yeah. And, uh, it, there I was sitting at the table and I looked to my right and in walks George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Elton John, Ringo Starr. And they all sit down like 10 feet from me. I was like, whoa, 
whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so uh, I looked at the bottle of champagne in front of me. I looked at George. I looked at the bottle. I looked at a glass. I filled it. I drank it. And I looked at George. And I filled it again. And I drank it. And I looked at George. And I said, maybe I'll have one more. And then I uh, said, I got to go say hello to George Harrison. This is it, man. This is it, Davy boy. No more chances. Go. And I had, uh, you know, I'd seen George in concert, but I'd never m- met him. And, and this is 19, like 89, you know, and I've been chasing that butcher cover since 1971. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that, that, that night when I went over to, to meet him, I kneeled down and he shook my hand and put his other hand on top of my hand. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, you know, I, I ordered your new book uh, on Genesis Publications. And he said, oh, I'm working on it. I have it upstairs if you want to come up and see it after this. I mean, can you imagine saying that to, 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 to anybody? Mm. It, it was crazy. But of course, you know, by then he's up on the stage with everybody, you know, from uh, him and Mick Jagger saying I saw her standing there. I didn't see him again, nor would I have pulled on his pants to say, uh, you said I could come up. <laughs> but um, a, a joy to to have met. What a wonderful guy. So and it's funny because up until that point, being in New York all the time, anytime I saw a limousine pull over, I'd stop and I'd wait till the door opened to see who got out. I was just hell bent on the, every limousine in New York City at every single minute of the day, a Beatle was gonna come out of that car. And so <laughs> finally yeah. when I met George, I could, stop, I could stop looking at limousine doors opening. Hmm. Yeah, you never know. Um, do you happen to know why Paul came back to Capitol? In fact, do you happen to know why he left to go to Columbia originally? No, I guess, you know, the rumors that I heard was that uh, they offered him more money and, and better better money than the other three were making on the Beatle catalog, which made them upset when they finally learned about it years later that he was getting a bigger piece of the pie and it wasn't split four ways. That's all hearsay. I don't know that, but I had heard that. And, um, you know, just like Dylan going back to Columbia after leaving for Geffen, mm-hmm. You know, you probably you have more. And I saw right away in the experience I shared a moment ago that uh, he was now in control of the product flow. And we weren't going to be seeing um, that rare record or those outtakes anytime soon. Mm. Yeah. Did Paul coming back to Capitol have anything to do? Like, did, was that a bargaining chip in Capitol not putting out the Sessions album? I would think that... Um, when you're looking at a compo, you know you're not looking at Paul McCartney. You're you're looking at a composer, you're looking at Capital, you're looking at a legendary label, you're looking to sign a blue chip artists. Um, to give you an example of of how serious this is, when I worked at Arista for two years, Clive kept telling us at every convention, every time we saw him, that he had signed somebody or a group he wouldn't tell us that was so big. But he couldn't tell us until the contract was over. But it was so big, we would all drop dead. And we thought, Jesus, Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones, Ringo, <laughs> one of the Beatles, Paul. Who could it be? This is Clive Davis. He, he's he's telling it all the time. Wait till you hear. I, I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. We signed all the notes. Give me a break. <laughs> <Yeah>. What? <laughs> you know, so... If Clive thinks that much about Hall and Oates, you can imagine Capital getting um, Paul McCartney back. I mean, if you look at the tug of war with Columbia Warner Brothers, where Paul Simon goes to Warner Brothers, you know, this sort of uh, taffy pulling, but nothing like one of the Beatles. So, uh, like I said, when he came back, he was treated like like number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so in reference to that, as I said, when he said that rec- the rarities of the sessions isn't coming. I knew it wasn't going to be coming out anymore and that Paul would play a big part uh, in the catalog and, uh, and the records forthcoming, which made me happy because I didn't like a lot of those love songs, real music. All, those records were just nothing to me. You know, those double album sets. It was putting a bad tarnish on Capitol, I thought. Actually, I really? remember I remember what you told me at the time about how those records were made. I, I remember it almost as if you're saying it right now. You said, yeah, you know what happens? They have a meeting and someone says, what do you want to do for a Beatles reissue? And someone else says, well, how about if we do a record with all girls' names, you know, Michelle, Love <laughs> Rita, whatever. And, th- and, and then uh, the guy leading the meeting will look at his watch and say, okay, I've got two o'clock. Meet me back here at three with a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Perfect. So, so it was something like that, wasn't it? <laughs> it always yes, seemed yes. it was something like that, actually, you know, just to the consumer. But uh, Dave, well. I wanted to. It's interesting he, hearing you uh, say, "Well, Paul, Paul thought of those unreleased, uh, that unreleased material in the middle '80s." But you know, less than ten years later, his definitely his opinion changed because the Beatles anthology ended up happening, and of course. He was all gung ho with the others to uh, tap into the archives. What do you think changed in McCartney's um, uh, opinion? Uh, what changed McCartney's opinion, rather, of uh, you know unreleased material from the archives coming out? You know, since you threw it at me, and so it's an opinion. I uh, I'll just shoot from the hip, which which is this: when we all grew up uh, following the Beatles, uh, we'd hear things like this. John, anything out there? I heard there's something in Italy, uh, you know, live thing in Italy. And uh, uh, and then there was uh, one time in Disc Magazine, some kid wrote into the letter to the editors, you know, there's songs like Circles. And uh, he mentioned a few titles that none of us had heard before. And then uh, that got into the chemistry of Beatle collector brains uh, colliding. He had these song titles. So um, then as, as as the years rolled by, the Beatles themselves said, there's nothing left. There's nothing in the can. We didn't even know Leave My Kitten Alone. None of us knew that. And so th there was nothing. There's nothing. So but Paul says, there's nothing. Then uh, I believe when, when they did the uh, EMI studio where they brought everybody in uh, that summer and, and played some of the tapes and went through it, they really got a great reaction from that uh, show and those tapes. And those tapes were sparkling, pristine, you know, and I guess they themselves went, you know, look at the reaction we were getting from the fans. I mean, it's beyond that they're into these uh, things we haven't finished. And that show was so popular, uh, uh, you know, nobody could even get into Abbey Road to hear the, that show. It was so sold out. And then uh, the, the, the tapes leaked. So uh, as time went on, I think that Paul, you know, really saw that there were some things in there that were worth uh, looking into. And uh, during that those periods, you know, Neil was putting together the Long and Winding Road movie, which had some very interesting things in it uh, from the beginning all the way up to the Let It Be film where he had You Win Again in stereo uh, that, you know, wasn't uh, ever put out. So um, they just hadn't gotten there yet is what i believe and um the beatles were less closed off to this dialogue of opening those vaults than a guy like dylan was dylan was consistent with his no way i hate it it's like seeing a painting from an artist it's not finished never happened and then his treasure trove opened so uh he was more hardcore than the beatles with the stuff and john when i would talk to him uh like with the life uh with the um get back to Toronto acetate or, or songs. He was very good natured about it, uh, but really, you know, he was now in America in 1971. So he really didn't have the time or, or exercise to say, uh, Hey, let's hear some old Beatle tapes or what do we got? Or what's it sound like? What's it look like? I don't think he ever had that experience where perhaps Paul still working with George Martin, moving over to Columbia. Maybe he made it sure that when he left, he was able to copy a lot of stuff for himself. Maybe Paul has every single tape at his home a perfect copy we don't who knows but i, I think that that's you know might have what happened keeping the beatles legacy alive and people you know around him you're so great you're so great you're so great let's look at it let's let's move it forward uh, that perhaps his heart opened mm -hmm. still it's hmm. kind of funny i mean what you told us about how paul responded concerning that means a lot that he thought it was really garbage and yet here it is in the beatles anthology yeah, I would think this, though. I would think that if he was challenged to come up with 14 songs for one main album, that wouldn't have made it. But since it was going to be, uh, you know, six CD, you know, whatever, a lot of music uh, that looking at that period, it would make sense. In fact, let me give you two more examples. I recently had lunch with uh, Rupert Perry and Rupert was chairman, uh, president of EMI for years. Uh, very uh, he's he's one under a sir. Sir Rupert Perry in England, and a fascinating gentleman. And um, he purchased that tape of the day that John met Paul, the Quarrymen tape uh, at that fair. Uh, 
-hmm. And they bought it at auction and he was putting it into the EMI archive files and made copies for the Beatles. And uh, he told me how very, very, very disappointed he was that when they did the anthology, they didn't use the tape that he spent tons of money for, which was the very first time they met. And the quality was just as good as the stuff that they used. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Well, quality yeah. was pretty rough but, on those. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but the, I, I bet they could do something with it today, though. I mean, the technology is so much you know, better than it was. Yeah, like for historical purposes, I, I think you could get away with it. But also, the, uh, the other, uh, the, there's so much to talk about. I'll just keep another little nugget here. But when they were working on the anthology, they had worked up to two songs from Shay. Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, and I forgot what the second one was. They got it in true stereo. And so on this anthology, these two new Shea Stadium songs in true stereo were going to be presented. And the real gamut of this was they were going to give credit to the guys who made it, who recorded it. Because think about this. When the Beatles were at Shea Stadium for an Ed Sullivan production, a 35 millimeter film recorded with uh, tons of budget, uh, George Martin wasn't behind the wheel. You know, like he had been for, um, like he was going to be for the Cavern Club show. He was going to be for Carnegie Hall. He uh, he was at the Hollywood Bowl. But George Martin wasn't behind the wheel of recording the Beatles at Shea Stadium. What happened? Well, they decided to use a guy who had worked with Frank Sinatra uh, doing live recordings. I've forgotten his name now, and I, I wish I had. So they brought him in to record the Beatles. So when Anthology came out, they got the two stereo tracks nobody ever heard, and they got the backstory to give this guy the credit and tell you the story. And then when the anthology came out, they only put out one song from Shea. They banged it down the mono, and they didn't give the guy the credit. Mm. But about Makes no sense. <laughs> Makes yeah. no sense. Could you just go through, because I know you just mentioned with the compilations on the Beatles that you never cared for those kind of things. But in 1982, you had real music and you had the Beatles' 20 greatest hits. So aside from putting a full-page ad in, say, Billboard or Cashbox, and having displays in retail, I would imagine the Capitol did very little to promote in radio for those compilations. I mean, they did have the benefit of the Beatles' movie Medley as a single to yeah. promote real music. Yeah. But other than that, how do you work those albums? Kind of like what we said before with something like Men Love Avenue. Well, 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 <laughs> I'm going to tell you the answer uh, because they were catalog type items. This is when, let's say, uh, you know, new album by Billy Squires out. Well, we, you know, we got to get it going. Well, give them 25 copies of the new Beatles album. OK, there's 25 love songs. All right. WDHA this weekend. Giving them away. And uh, that's what you would do. You'd, you'd use that for currency. Yeah, that's the way to promote it in radio, just by giveaways and nothing else. Exactly. You know, mm. give it to the guy who, who's in the promo truck just to, you know, there was you just were. You, for instance, you listen to uh, this is tricky, so I got to be careful how I word it. But uh, you could tell a passionate dish jockey when uh, they're speaking. I'll use Pat St. John as an example. You know, this guy creates this movie in his head and when he plays a song he'll tell you what you heard and you will walk away smarter but then there are other guys that you'll you know throw songs together and the this jockey will come back and go all right <clears throat> that was steve miller steve miller's greatest hits we heard crosby stills and nash that was from crosby stills and nash greatest hits that was uh, the eagles and that was from the eagles greatest hits we'll be right back and <laughs> <laughs> so there's that you know so uh you know, with the Beatle bang, what were you going to get out of it? You know, uh, it's almost like the twisted. I, I use an example in my book of the twist and shout song, which uh, Capital at the time is trying to break a uh, taste of honey. And it's the most important thing is to uh, cross over this act uh, to pop radio. And we're closing in on the top 30, the most critical time. And we get sideswiped or Capital gets sideswiped by twist and shout being the few Ferris Bueller movie. And another movie, and those radio stations that are playing it are banging it, and it's getting top 40 airplay up to Wazoo and reacting like a brand new record, and nobody ever heard of the Beatles. And Capitol's <laughs> trying to beat it down with a whiff to get out of the way. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
You would think they would welcome that because that would help the whole catalog sell, the Beatles catalog. And not only that, my, my chapter on that ends that uh, Taste of Honey doesn't cross over, doesn't go top 30, and the Beatles go to the <laughs> Beatles bake it. Yeah, I know. That that was the game. You know, what, whatever the – you think about it like Best Buy today. You know, how can you get your product in the biggest shops with the lowest price and saturate it? Let's put out a double Beatles set, sell it cheap, get it in Best Buy, have them – or, you know, roar it up, put it on a pallet in front of the people walking in. Anybody walks in is going to stop and look at a Beatle album and buy it as an impulse. Uh, th- that's where those things w- were coming from. There was no real uh, connect on those records. Now, explain one thing to me here. When the Beatles one came out, it was the biggest thing worldwide. I looked at that release and I said, that's the Beatles 20 greatest hits. It is the exact same concept. It's all number one records, only in this case, you've got the British number ones, too. So here's, an, here's the, the biggest release of, I believe, that whole decade, the first decade of the 2000s. It explodes like that. And then 20 Greatest Hits doesn't do that well. I mean, it went gold. But, I mean, is it all just promotion? Is it timing? What is it? it? You know, the two, I, I, I don't want to give up their names, but the two guys that claim, they love to claim. People in the record business love to take credit. I'm not that guy. These two guys that claim to have created that and, and they deserve uh, that thing on the wall. It's like 25 gold albums. And you walk in and you go, wow, you must be really famous. Well, those two guys that did that, I, I'm not on that team. I thought it was a lousy cover. It had been done before. There was nothing. I Nothing uh, caught my attention of that to say that this was a creative, wonderful endeavor of what we're used to, used to from the Beatles. You know, groundbreaking, colorful. Every step the Beatles made was the was the best, and this was was not. Uh, and yet it it went. You know, it went. And uh, I think it's because the, that guy who those two guys I'm talking about, the sort of the chairman and this, the head of the sales guys, they put their heads together. They said, let's put all the money behind it. Let's blow it out the door. Let's give huge discounts. Let's get it in the step downs, the end caps. Let's run it on the ads. And they did. And it, uh, you know, maybe enough time had gone by that nobody realized they could get all the Beatles songs on on one thing. And per, uh, and perhaps uh, that was on a CD and maybe the other one uh, wasn't the 20 greatest hits. Hmm. Plus it had the truncated Hey Jude. Who wants that? <laughs> except, <laughs> except, of course, as a collector, you have to have it to show what things were done to <laughs> Beatles recordings. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's funny. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you that moment at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when you met George, that was the only time you met George? Um, George Harrison. The only, yes, that would be the only time I met George Harrison. And you met Ringo at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Did you talk to him at all? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want to um, intrude. Uh, Ringo was to my left. I was on my knee and George was to my right. And uh, they had just come in as a posse. You know, it was getting late. The show was just about to start and they plopped down. The last thing you want is a bunch of maniac fans running over for autographs or to touch you, you know. So I was very cautious uh, and, and got between them. But Ringo, I first met Ringo. It was interesting. My friend Ivan Kraut, and, and God bless his soul, we just lost him the last 90 days. He had come from Czechoslovakia in 1968 uh, and left there and came to America and uh, was living in Long Island City. And he got a job uh, working at uh, Apple, at APCO, Crowell and Klein, and, and working in the mailroom where all the Beatles stuff was, Beatle pictures and things of that nature. And um, I ran into him then. Now, Ivan went on to uh, be uh, in Patti Smith's group, Iggy Pop's group. He wrote songs that David Bowie has covered, uh, you two have covered. So he had an illustrious career and he was a dear friend. So I first met him uh, again at, when he worked at APCO. I went up to uh, John was at the immigration hearings downtown. I was going down to take pictures and, and you know, yell questions at him, things of this nature. And, um, and when it was over, say 10, 30, 11 in the morning, I'd hightail it up to APCO and go up to the 42nd floor and meet with Ivan. I'd say, is there any new Beatle pictures I could have? And he'd come out with a little yellow envelope and put stuffed Beatle pictures in it. And I'd be on my way. And uh, as our relationship grew, he'd say, uh, come on back. Come on back. It's okay. Come on back. And all of a sudden I'd be in this room. And all of a sudden that envelope with five pictures became an envelope with a hundred pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and we became close. So at this point, 
I showed him the Beetle Butcher cover, and um, one day he called me, and he said, Ringo's coming up uh, to the office today. I said, what time? He goes, I don't know. So I raced over, parked my car, and there's two entrances to the building, so I had to really manipulate and maneuver this thing, and uh, you couldn't really hang out by the elevators. And uh, sure enough, here comes Ringo, and uh, you know, I raced over. I had my camera. I had my, my Beetle Butcher cover in an envelope. And uh, it was all so chaotic and so quick, I couldn't get the camera out. But uh, I had a marker, and he wrote Ringo Starr beautifully, beautifully. And uh, he said, this is very nice. And he was quiet. Maybe he was going to a meeting uh, uh, to ask for money and not get it. Maybe he was whatever. You never know a person's mood. He was somber. He was somber at this, at this particular uh, moment and signed it. And I was completely uh, thrilled and uh, was ready to, to leave and go home. But when I got outside, Fans had come. Uh, I don't know how people always find out where people are, but they did. And uh, so a group of about 20 people gathered. So I hung out and there's the, all the girls would stand together and the guys. And uh, now I had my camera ready. So uh, Ringo comes out and it looked like he was wearing the, the jacket he wears on the Abbey Road cover, like that coat. I thought, oh, boy, that's the coat he's got on Abbey Road, man. Look at this. And so as he's hopping in the limo, I take a picture of him popping in. And uh, and that was it. So my day's gone. All right. Let's fast forward 50 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's these Beatle blogs now. And uh, Sarah Schmidt has one called, you know, Meet the Beatles for Real. Right. And so I'm, I'm gazing through this because I always thought it was so enjoyable to see fans photographs of the Beatles. What a wonderful hardcover color book that would make. So uh, I'm looking through it one day and son of a gun. Here's a picture that somebody sent her uh, of that day, and she snapped a picture of Ringo getting in the car the same time I did, and I'm in the background taking the picture of Ringo that I have. So I was like, whoa! <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> there's Dave taking the picture of Ringo, and there's the butcher cover under his arm. So uh, that's how I, I met Ringo, and it was just terrific. That's funny. So in the end... You had every signature except George. Except George. And the night at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I was uh, two things were going on mentally. You got to remember, this was the induction of the Beatles. The Beatles. The Beatles were going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Paul was going to be there. Ringo and George. This was the hug. This was the kiss. This was it. This was going to be in a ballroom at the Waldorf Astoria for less than 500 people. Top, maybe 300. This was it, fellas. No mistakes being made. This was the ducket, the ticket. This was the place to be. So do I drag a Beetle Butcher cover uh, that could get bent? Uh, you know, how do I get it in there? What if there's some kind of security I'm not aware, aware of? Uh, what if he doesn't want to sign? What if he's not sitting? What, what am I going to do? Or how about I put a tape recorder in my cummerbund and uh, I record the Beetle reunion? You know, the Beatles reunion, unedited, you know, that's the, that's the way to go, Davey. So I went with that. And um, after I told you when I met George, got between him and got the double handshake, we split up. And uh, a little bit later, I had to go to the bathroom from the, all that champagne. And uh, I was sitting right in the middle. Barry Gordy was in front of me. To the left was uh, Mike Love, Muhammad Ali. Uh, so I'm walking all the way to the back where the bathroom is, where all the clatter is, where all the dirty dishes are, where all the noises. And all of a sudden I look, I go, oh, my God, there's the president of my company. There's Seymour Stein, the president of uh, Sire. These are all uh, the people that are supposed to be at our table. And we're supposed to be at this table. The girl screwed the tickets up. Run, Dave, run. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe Smith grabs me by the arm. He goes, I'm sitting by the fucking closet. Where are you sitting? I said, oh, I got to go to the bathroom, Joe. I'll be right back. You know, I ran. So I run to the bathroom. And who's talking? There's Scott Muni. And he's talking to George Harrison and Jeff Lynn. So uh, I, I stand next to them. And a kid walks up uh, and says, George, could you sign my album? And he goes, not tonight. I'm not signing anything tonight. I'm enjoying myself. And I thought, thank God I didn't pull the Beatle cover on them. You know, thank God. <laughs> Not that I would have set it up like that, but geez, mm. please. So um, I was at peace now. I met George. Here I was sitting, standing with him with Scott. So, and, uh, you know, so uh, 
So then I went back in and got the tape recorder rolling. Meanwhile, you know, it exploded that night. Paul didn't come. Uh, Mike Love was off his rocker. And uh, <laughs> the music we did get was out of this world. And I captured it all beautifully. And uh, when it ended, I ran over to NEW FM like at, uh, you know, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock. And we sat up and edited the thing. And so that when uh, 6 a.m. came and everybody was waking up, you could come on with this incredible Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Beatles were inducted. Paul didn't show. And uh, the, the jam with Billy Joel, uh, Mick Jagger, Bruce Springsteen. Here it is. And then play it. Oh, man, that's a promotion, man. I was in like Flint and it sounded great. It was a great radio presentation the next morning. And uh, I made sure they didn't mention my name so that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was, <laughs> was chasing me down the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. And Mark Chernoff, who was the program director there, is the same person who hired me at WGHA. Wow. Yeah. In 1983. So, yeah. <laughs> it's nice. amazing. Yeah, it sure is. We were so we're so uh, lucky, fellas, and uh, that 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 could go either way. You know, you could get a bad luck and good luck, and we sure have had good luck. We've been together as a, you know, for a very long time, and I'm so grateful to be on the show today and and to know you, fellas. Thank you today. Thank you. Very well, thanks for coming, Dave. We should uh, get you to tell the listeners how they can get a copy of the book and the previous books. Yeah, I got four books out now. I, 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 I spread them out over a bunch of years because I thought uh, my friend Lisa Robinson did one big book. And uh, after, you know, uh, four or five months, uh, it dries up and nobody knows you ever wrote a book. So to stay relevant, uh, I put it out over I was going to go with four books in four years. I was able to do four books in uh, six years. And uh, I learned a lot. It was fascinating to do it. It was great to share it. Uh, this one is, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, this one is all about 1980 to 1990, and it's called The Runout Groove, uh, Inside Capital's 1980s Hits and Stiffs. And uh, my three other books are available. They're all on Amazon. But uh, since we're talking about this book, let me leave you with this. This new book, three things I want everybody to know about. A third of this book is about meeting artists and running around with them. And so it's Graham Nash, people is like the plasmatics. It's, it's those kind of stories about what it's like to uh, meet these people and go out and be a promotion man. The book really focused, I tried on Yoko, the Beatles stories, the, the, these albums of the solo Beatles. I tried to in, in, encapsulate that experience to people that love the Beatles like myself. And a third of the book, I put together all the conference calls that we had at the K label. And it's really important because I wasn't sure if people would laugh hard at this nonsense or cry and want promo seltzer. So it's been fascinating what people are getting out of it. And what I find interesting is it, it, people think what a glamorous life uh, it was. But boy, when you hear those calls uh, in my book, it's a whole new way to look at things and try to survive those. And uh, many people say to me, Dave, there's a lot of that uh, in, in your book. And I said, yes, but imagine I had to stay on the phone. And I had to listen to other people. I couldn't just turn the page. So uh, uh, that's the that's the gist of it. I really hope uh, everybody gets out of it uh, the joy I had putting into it. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Darren. And thank you, Ken. And thank you, Dave. Yeah. And I love the book. It really gives you a good idea of what you went through during that decade and all the hard work you had thank to go you. through in promoting all, all the artists and, you know, the, the good and the bad. It's a yeah. good mixture of it. Yeah. Thank you for reading it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that we had you on the show. I mean, I didn't have the opportunity to kind of tell the folks listening that uh, you and I, our paths crossed in the, uh, I guess, the early mid-90s uh, when I was kind of wet behind the ears in my first years at WFUV. And you were at Wyndham Hill uh, and WFUV, which was at that time a station that was playing a lot of acoustic music. There was a big boom of uh, singer-songwriters and acoustic music that hit like right at the tail end of the 80s and early 90s. And Wyndham Hill had a subsidiary label they started up, High Street Records. And there were so many um, artists on High Street that were like right down the middle for us at WFUV in the 90s. And it was always a lot of fun when, when Dave Morell was bringing an artist around or you were at a show that was uh, featured uh, Wyndham Hill people. And now, you know, it's, it had been years. We lost touch with each other. Uh, and yeah. I don't... You're not in uh, working in rate in promotions on with labels any longer, right? 
No, no, I'm retired and uh, that's it, fellas. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this brought us back together here in 2020. I'm still at FUV. Some things never change, but Good. Uh, it was great having you, uh, being able to catch up with you here on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. I feel the same way back at you, and I'm glad you're in radio. People need to hear that beautiful voice of yours on the airwaves there. So keep it going. Thanks, Dave. And, <laughs> and Dave, how do people get in contact with you if they want to? Okay. Yeah. You could reach me on Facebook. Uh, you could reach me on email, Dave Morell one not O-N-E, Dave Morell one at Mac.com. That would be the way to reach me. Yeah. And I'm um, very open. I've, uh, you know, I get mail all the time. Somebody wrote me a, a recent question, said, Dave, when you were at Capitol Records, I read your book. Wait, what was it like when you got a number one? Were they really thrilled? And I said, well, turn to page 87. We had a call and it began like this. Call's about to start, and I want to say this. Steve Miller called me, said he had a number one record. He wants to thank you all. He, Steve says it was the first number one record since the Nax My Sharona. So Steve is very happy. Me? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, they weren't happy when you got a number one record. Please read my book, and thank you. I love being with Alan, who I've known so long, and I love being with Darren, who... When I'm not talking to him, I get to hear him on the radio. And Ken, it just feels like uh, every time we talk, you're in the other room and we just keep it going like we always have. So, gentlemen, with your history and bringing on a rookie like me, I'm so thrilled to be part of the, the show this afternoon. I hope we get to meet again. It was a blast having you on. And it was you're welcome trip. anytime. Thanks uh, so okay. much, Dave. You're welcome, fellas. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So we're going to go around and give our contact information, starting with Darren. All righty. Uh, you can email me at WFUV. The email address is DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. And the name is D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Uh, I'm always on Facebook. And uh, I actually have two Facebook pages. One is Darren DeVivo. And uh, my other page uh, has a rather cumbersome name, Darren DeVivo, WF, I'm trying to pull it up here because I can never remember it, Darren DeVivo, WFUV, DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. You'll find both of those if you search for my name. Like, like them, friend me, and we'll be in touch that way. Okay, and Ken, how do people reach you? Well, you can reach me by my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Of course, I have my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Since we mentioned An Accidental Studio, the brand new documentary on George's Handmade Films, I should point out that starting Monday, July the 20th, I'm giving away copies on Blu-ray on my website, on my Beatles Trivia and Games page, along with a whole bunch of other new items uh, as prizes on the website, like the uh, ebook for Eight Arms to Hold You, from Chip Manninger and Mark Easter, who we just had recently as guests on this show. If you like the interview that you just heard with Dave Morell and you want to hear more of Dave, well, I also did an interview with Dave, which is on my website. We talk a lot more about uh, Press to Play in the interview and Flowers in the Dirt. And there's a whole bunch of other topics in my interview that we didn't even touch on here. And you can listen to that at my website, on uh, interviews page four, that's where all my most recent interviews are, and that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget, every other Monday night, you can catch me on the video podcast called Talk More Talk, which is all about the solo careers of the Beatles. I'm joined by Kid O'Toole, Ken Womack, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo, also known as Mean Mr. Mayo. And that's every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page, which is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And if you want to catch my syndicated show for every little thing, uh, next week I'll be doing a brand new show. It's an entire hour of uh, Beatle and solo Beatles songs with male names in the song titles. Kind of like the Capitol meetings where they're <laughs> discussing what to put together for a compilation. Mm -hmm. I think it works better on a radio show than for an album myself. Definitely. But uh, I will prove that to you if you listen to the show. And all you have to do is uh, catch my Every Little Thing page 
on my website, which lists all the radio stations that carries the show and when they air with links to their websites. And again, that's at my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And that's about it. Okay. And you can contact me at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook. That's the easiest way. Or you can write to all of us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. I'll say it again. It's one word Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab. You can find the shows on Podbeam, um, YouTube, and iTunes. And um, I guess that's it for reaching. Oh, we also have a Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fan Facebook page. And there is a Things We Said Today Facebook page. Uh, we post links to the show there. Uh, so, you know, check it every now and then. Uh, perhaps let us know what you think. Set up some dialogue, see what's going on. And uh, that's that. So... Uh, I think, you know, we had a great talk with Dave. It's always fun. And um, for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.